Welcome back to Capitol Beat. It's Friday, February 5th, 2016, and it's week five in the legislature. We are going to talk a little bit about paid sick leave and some other issues. And joining me as always is Vermont Press Bureau reporter Josh O'Gorman and Senator Philip Baruth from Chittenden County. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, the paid sick leave bill we thought was coming to a close uh, this week with passage in the Senate on a 21 to 8 vote. Uh, the Senate made some, some changes, defeated an amendment that would have uh, allowed for a small business exemption. Um, and then we got to Thursday, and there was a, there was a little bit of a development. Yeah. So um, maybe you can sort of set the stage for us of what transpired this week um, and what will happen next week. Sure. Um, just so people know, the paid sick leave bill is designed to help people who work in jobs and who have historically worked in jobs right. uh, in retail mostly, food service mostly, mm -hmm. uh, where they have no paid time off at all. Right. No vacation time, no combined time, no sick time. And what that means is that these people, often at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, they have no ability to stay home with a sick child. Mm -hmm. If they themselves are sick, they can't stay home. So when you go through the drive-in window at your fast food place, you may be served by someone who is contagious, but they had to make that choice. Can I afford to lose a day's wage, or should I stay home? Right. And they made the decision to serve you your burger. Right. So that's who the law was designed to help. At the last minute, there was a move to carve out businesses with five or fewer employees. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that's a third of the group we were trying to help. In addition, it was about 20,000 people. I exactly. In addition, those five or fewer are overrepresenting the population who don't provide the benefit. So it was really, as I view it, uh, a move that struck at the very heart of what we were trying to do. Okay. And so all the way through the committee process, all the way onto the floor, we had managed to um, do many, many other things to help small business, but avoid that. And this is a kind of final procedural move to try right. to get that. So it's my understanding that the uh, the bill that you passed in the Senate kept kept in place what the House passed, which was three earned sick days allowed in the first two years of employment, which would then bump up to five yes. days after that. And with with an important caveat. Yes. So so as I say, in the Senate, we were very concerned about small business. So uh, my colleague Senator Ballin added an amendment to protect. Uh, new business startups. Right. So you have an extra year if you're a startup. One year from the day you hire your first employee. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then the other thing that was done is my colleague uh, Senator Snelling, who is a business-minded Republican, but uh, somebody who has typically um, spoken as well to issues like this. Mm -hmm. She put in an amendment to have any business with five or fewer employees have that same ramp up period of two years. Right. So with those caveats, uh, that was the bill we were looking at. Okay. As I mentioned at the top, it was a 21 to 8 vote on Wednesday. Yes. Um, and the, the, the amendment you mentioned from Senator Brian Campion, a Democrat, yes. um, failed on a 14 to 15 vote. Right. But it did have at least five or six Democratic votes uh, yes. in favor of it. So we fast forward to Thursday when Senator Bill Doyle of Washington County um, asked to reconsider his vote. Yes. And that triggered a whole new process. Um, it, perhaps you can break the, the rules and the process down for folks who sure. may not be familiar what happens at, at that point. So just so you know, when the framers put the system together and the people who wrote the rule books like Masons right. and other people, their overriding idea is that it should be very hard to pass legislation. It should take a long time. Right. And I think that was a wise way to set it up. So for instance, a motion to adjourn is always preferred and in order. So no matter what's going on, if you say everybody should go home, the rules <laughs> prefer that. Yeah. And when you think about it, it's, it's a very good way of slowing the process a little bit, making sure that we're sure of what we're doing. So uh, Senator Doyle used a very little used procedure, which is if you vote with the winning majority on any issue, yes. within 24 hours you can ask to reconsider. I think that's fair enough. The question is, having reconsidered that question, do
do you open up the entire debate again to a myriad of other questions? And that's where we're still trying to get clarity from the Senate Secretary, among others. So Bill Doyle asked to revisit the final vote on the bill and the vote on the Campion Amendment. And that's his right. But my feeling is that we should be limiting ourselves to that, not redoing the entire debate that produced the 21 to 8 right. uh, winning vote. So how common is this uh, for somebody to uh, move to reconsider their, their vote and reopen up something that had been finished, really, more or less the day before? It's not common at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually used when everybody in the chamber thought they were doing something mm -hmm. and a piece got dropped out. Mm -hmm. And so most everyone wants this piece in. One of the easiest ways to do that is to have a senator reconsider their vote very quick, mm -hmm. you put in the amendment, and you move on. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way it's usually used in, in a sense with the will of the body moving in one direction. Mm -hmm. It's very rare, as in this case, to have a 15-14 vote mm -hmm. and then to have somebody use it strategically to get a new vote. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go back to the death of dignity debate, mm -hmm. as you remember, incredibly hot-button issue. Right. We fought <clears throat> for years, usually 15-15 or... Uh, you know, 15, 14, those kind of votes. So after two days of debate, we managed to pass the Death with Dignity Bill. And then I don't know if you remember, but Bob Hartwell, who was actually Brian Campion's uh, predecessor right, in right. that seat, said he wanted to reconsider his vote. And after an hour or so of discussion, he pulled that back. But that's the last time I remember it being used in that way by effectively the losing side and uh, going to someone on the winning side and saying, mm -hmm. will you mm -hmm. reconsider so that we can have another bite at the apple? Sure. If the Campion Amendment is adopted, then who will benefit from this legislation? Is it, uh, I guess, retail workers who work at chains, uh, fast food restaurant workers who work at chains, but not, sounds like it won't be like small in, in, independent workers, I suppose, right? Well, any business with five or fewer employees would not be obligated to provide paid sick leave. Okay. So, I suppose you could say they gain, although they would be doing just what they do now. Mm -hmm. um, the people who lose mm -hmm. are the 20,000 plus who literally have no option but to go to work sick. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have three girls and, and I work in the state house and it's in Montpelier and my wife is in Burlington. So when our girls get sick, she's the go-to person. I mean, if things here aren't crazy, I stay home with the girls and she goes and teaches. But that's because we have the liberty and the luxury right. of two incomes. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of single moms out there, and that's who this disproportionately is. Mm -hmm. Single mothers, people on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale who have sick children. If you got kids, you know, this is a, uh, a feature rather than a right. bug. Kids get sick. Mm -hmm. So this legislation is very, very business friendly at this point. We've carved out many things that were offensive to the business community. We've given them lots of ramp up time. But at the end of the day, the question is, will we mandate it? And I believe, like the minimum wage, this is something that's a minimum for everybody. And we shouldn't be saying, well, you work at a business with four employees, so you don't get it. That doesn't make any sense to me. Right. Uh, I spoke to Governor Peter Shumlin this morning about this very topic. And he said he would like to see the original Senate bill pass without the small business exemption. Yes and to uh, get to his desk quickly. So we know that on Wednesday, if Senator Doyle switches his vote, it becomes, uh, the amendment goes from losing 14 to 15 to potentially winning 15 to 14. Mm -hmm. So what happens between now and Wednesday, and what's your prediction on uh, what will happen with that amendment? Well, I think Senate President Pro Tem John Campbell was very wise to put the question out a few days. Mm -hmm. And that gives us all time to rethink and reconsider. Um, I think in large part, uh, even when we're talking about it here, we're talking about the Campion Amendment as the small business exemption or the business friendly thing. What people need to hear again, uh, I tried to make this point on the floor, but I think it's worth communicating as many times as possible. We have already done a great deal for small business, including that uh, Senator Snelling's amendment, which gives them two full years before they would need to do anything. Right. So communicating that is number one. 
Number two, um, there's a report in Vermont Digger this morning um, of some behind the scenes action, which personally I found troubling. And, and I think that that's something that needs to be looked into. Um, I won't go into great detail, detail except to say that um, it involved uh, people from the other chamber trying to work our chamber, things that we usually, uh, in, in a civil way, try to stay away from. So that's another part is cleaning up our process, making sure that everybody's working in an above board and, uh, and methodical way. Well, to be fair, yes, uh, they did use rules that are available to any senator yes. at any time. Yep. Uh, there was no, you know, uh, unethical behavior here is, is from my reading of what happened. It, well, they I, simply they. I, I don't know if you've read the Digger account. I have. So, so the question would be: Is their reporting accurate? Um, is their reporting a full accounting of what happened? And I can't speak to those. But what I'm saying is that I found that account troubling in its presentation of what was going on to produce the motion by Senator Doyle to reconsider. I also think if the intention is to use reconsideration to open up a whole host of other amendments, uh, to me that strikes at the heart of the process. So we will have passed a bill, and then on one person's say-so, we will then revisit the entire debate. That seems to me counterproductive and really not in the spirit of the rules as written. But, but again, not a violation of, of Senate rules. It's, it's permitted under the rules. And well, I would argue we're, we're seeking an interpretation okay. of the second part. So, so you're right. Reconsideration yeah. is allowed. And let's but, but the rest is interpretation that we're still getting from the Senate Secretary. And we should point out that this is the type of lobbying effort that happens every day in this building by paid lobbyists, by lawmakers. I disagree. By, well, if you look at the, at the Digger story, right. they're talking about an extraordinary form of uh, pressure on a, on a single member, and I think as they describe it, I, I just think it, it comes up to the line, if not crossing it, in terms of behavior that you don't want happening every day in the State House. All right. So, uh, I, again, I can't speak to the complete nature of the reporting. Maybe you will uh, provide another angle on the story, but sure. I, I woke up to that this morning, and it, it didn't help my breakfast day. So we'll agree that the that the rule was used in a way that's allowed. Yes. Uh, how we got to that point, perhaps. And then what happens after that. thereafter? Those yeah. are both cloudy, but you're absolutely correct okay. on the rule itself. All right, Senator Baru, thank you so much for yeah. joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Hey, thank you. Good to talk to you. And welcome back. We're now going to talk to Speaker Shap Smith. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, it's great to be here. Good. We uh, we chatted with Senator Baruth earlier about paid sick leave. Um, your chamber passed this bill last year. Uh, pretty slim margin, 72 to 63, I think it was. The Senate has made some some changes that they say are even more palatable to small business. Um, I'm assuming you've had a chance to look at those changes. How are you feeling about those Senate changes uh, at this point? Well, the bill in the House was the result of a pretty delicate negotiation uh, between business interests and those who uh, really felt right. that working Vermonters needed some help. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a compromise that we felt pretty comfortable with. Uh, I have some concerns about what I'm seeing coming out of the Senate. It's not clear to me that it would work in the House. Now, the Senate bill that passed out of committee and came to the floor uh, was one that we were discussing and we felt uh, we were pretty comfortable with. I think that the five-person exemption could create some real challenges. How about the, so there were two amendments as we briefly talked about earlier. Uh, the Campion Amendment to put in the five employer or fewer small business exemption and then another one from Senator Diane Snelling uh, uh, that essentially bumps out the uh, waiting period till 2018 for small mm -hmm. businesses with five or fewer. Is that something you'll accept? So I haven't seen uh, Senator Snelling's amendment, so I can't really speak to that. I was okay. referring to the uh, Campion Amendment, which right. I think would run into some real challenges in the House. Okay. Now, look, we uh, resolve these challenges all the time. Uh, my sense is it would go to a conference committee and we would uh, deal with it there if it came back. 
Do you think it's headed to a conference committee no matter what, whether there is the small business exemption or not? Uh, you know, I can't speak for the leadership of the committee. I have uh, talked briefly with Helen Head. I think that the bill as it came out of committee is something that we would be willing uh, to look at and probably would be acceptable, although I can't say for sure. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll move on to a couple, couple of other topics. It's been a few weeks, about a month now, since the governor uh, put out his plans for the session. What, uh, what can you tell us about where some of these initiatives are at this point in the House, particularly with the budget and other funding mechanisms? So the budget, uh, it, we are just starting to really dig into the budget. The Appropriations Committee got the budget last week, and uh, they're trying to understand all the moving parts. The Ways and Means Committee is taking a look at the uh, revenue that was recommended by the administration. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, our evaluation right now is, uh, is the revenue that uh, has been proposed appropriate? Um, is the size of the box for the revenue appropriate? Is there a place within the budget that we could find some more savings? Um, and uh, you know, what about the new proposals that have been put forward? So we're digging into that. The conversation has been good. Mitzi Johnson, who's the chair of appropriations, is checking in on a daily basis, and as is Janet Ansel. So I feel good about the process. Okay. Was there anything that's been sort of uh, ruled out already by your members? I'm, I'm sure you've had some informal. Uh, polling and discussions with with the Democratic caucus at this uh, point. Well, you know, you we, <laughs> you may assume more organization than really exists. Uh, no, we haven't ruled anything out, and you know, mm -hmm. frankly, I think it's uh, hard for you to rule anything out unless you have got some sort of alternative. And so, yeah. you know, I, it's really important for us to fully understand what the budget is, where the spending is, and then we can understand uh, are there areas that we can change for the revenue side. One of the, one of the, one of the proposals that Governor Shulman offered was uh, expanding a tax that's currently on hospitals and nursing homes to include doctors and dentists so as to help close the so-called Medicaid gap. Um, is that something that you would, would support at this point? You know, I, I want to see how it works in other states. I do think that it's something that's open for uh, discussion. I think the challenge there is that if we're going to raise that money, off of the providers, we have to make sure that we're putting money back in their pockets, mm -hmm. uh, in, increased reimbursement. We don't want it to be a net loss for them. So that's what I need to understand fully mm -hmm. in looking at the budget. Looking back, you know, in hindsight, do you think that the 0.7% payroll tax that he proposed in 2015 would have been the right move in hindsight now to, to close that gap or what? Uh, I thought it was the right move last right. year. Yeah. I, I was uh, uh, somebody who supported that idea. I do think that the challenge around that particular revenue source uh, was making sure that people who were paying it felt like they, they would get a net benefit from it. In other words, that the whole theory is that the Medicaid uh, shortfall it ends up being uh, subsidized by insurance premiums. Yeah. And so there's a hidden tax on insurance premiums. We needed to show businesses who were paying a payroll tax that that hidden tax was going to be reduced. And I don't think we did that effectively last year. Uh, the, the pop bill is working its way through the Senate right now. And uh, it, it looks like it won't be voted on today by the Senate Finance Committee. It'll bump into next week. Are we really running out of time here for your side of uh, the building to, to do its due diligence? Well, it's clearly going to need a lot of diligence in the House. It's going to be something that hasn't been uh, really fully vetted in, in years past. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that starts from a building right. block already. Uh, I think it's too early to declare that we're running out of time. Uh, I, you know, my, my hope is that a bill will show up uh, at, in the House either at the end of February or uh, shortly after we get down the town meeting break. And, um, Which then, is the end of February, really. Uh, right. Well, no, <laughs> shortly after the town okay. meeting break. And, but at that point in time, we can focus on it. I, you know, I've been very clear with the governor that uh, we will look at the bill. I have also been clear with him that my read is that it doesn't have enough support right now in the House. I'm not saying that that will be the case later, right. um, but that people have real questions about it. 
not only about the substance of the bill, but about whether this is the time to do it. Yeah, I mean, there was a real conspicuous lack of applause uh, during the governor's State of the State address when he announced that initiative compared with other things that he yeah. had announced. I, I didn't notice that. I mean, it, you know, look, I think that uh, regulation of marijuana is is something that is going to happen in the state of Vermont. And I think that it's something that we have to make sure we do right. And it's not about doing it quickly. So um, I'm curious to see what the uh, Sears bill does. I haven't had a chance to fully look at it. I'm looking forward to briefing on it soon. Mm -hmm. I think Senator Sears will appreciate you attaching his name to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, do you think that the, he had a press conference? He did. He did. <laughs> so. Do you think the governor uh, has the ability to sell it to the House at this point? Uh, essentially, you and I have talked about this before, and you've said it's up to really one person, the governor, mm -hmm. to sell it not only to the House but to Vermonters. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, is that I possible still? So I think that the uh, administration needs to work hard to uh, demonstrate that this is a workable uh, format. And you know, go governor's gonna be part of that. But it's not just the governor, it also has to be Vermonters. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think that people's ambivalence is a reflection of many of their constituents. And uh, you know, I agree with the governor that the uh, war on drugs ha with regard to marijuana has been a failed war. Um, the question is, what would be successful, and is this it? And that's, I think, the real question. You know, I had a group of kids come in from my son's middle level, right. uh, and they <clears throat> came and talked to me about uh, the legalization and regulation of marijuana, and they were split. And they were really concerned about whether um, this would increase access to marijuana among um, young people. Yeah. But the thing that I asked them was, how hard is it to get marijuana now? And they all agreed it's actually pretty easy. At the middle school at, level. At, mm -hmm. at the middle school. There wow. were some middle school and high school. And so that tells me, and they said that it was easier to get than, pop, than alcohol mm -hmm. and cigarettes. Yeah. So that tells me that we've got a problem on our hands right. already. And the question is, will this address that problem? Yeah. Uh, before we let you go, have you been following the presidential race? I have, yeah. Do you have, do you have a <laughs> prediction for the, the primary in New Hampshire on Tuesday? Uh, I think it's too early to call. Too early? Yeah, but really? I think that there's probably a good chance that a Vermonter might win the race. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Very good. All right, and before we wrap up today's show, we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences on the uh, campaign trail following Bernie Sanders. Um, I was out in Iowa for the caucuses, uh, mm -hmm. spent the weekend and, uh, and a few days after out there. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say, I, I very much appreciate our primary system in our ballot voting system. Yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about, <laughs> about the insanity that it is, yeah. is the caucus. Did you see anyone flipping any coins to decide any I, races? There were no coin tosses at my, my precinct that I was at. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, I won't even say controlled chaos, it was just straight up chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds and hundreds of people ch packed into a church uh, trying to figure out how many Hillary supporters were there, how many Bernie supporters were there. And uh, in the end, it wasn't much going to make much difference because it was very clear that the Hillary people outnumbered the Bernie people. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the counting, the way they counted did uh, seem a little haphazard. And uh, I wonder how that might have impacted things if the count was closer than it really was. Mm -hmm. um, it's a sort of uh, a throwback system of government. I'm not sure it's the most effective and efficient uh, election system, but you know it is what it is. And as we all know, Bernie Sanders came in second place in Iowa, uh, lost by three tenths of a percent to Hillary. We think there's some questions about, as I mentioned, the the system. Uh, Bernie sort of clings to that at times. Other times he says, "Yeah, Hillary won." Mm -hmm. um, so he does because of that showing. You took a lot of momentum into New Hampshire, where you were this week. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's happening on the ground there. Absolutely. So uh, shortly after uh, Iowa, he, I guess he flew into, I think, Nashua at about 5, 5 a.m. on yeah. Tuesday morning. And uh, there was a big uh, gaggle of uh, faithful who were there to meet, meet him at the airport. And um, he had an event in Keene. Um, and I, I talked with an 18-year-old who had spent much of the last night before uh, putting up just Bernie signs all through town. So <laughs> as soon as I rolled into Keene, I knew exactly where where, where so I he, was and where I was welcome. going. He was cer certainly yeah. welcome. And uh, yeah, we he, should know that's kind of a college town with uh, Keene State mm -hmm. down there. 
uh, really strong Bernie country. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is how liberal it was, you know, rather than demonizing single mothers, when Bernie mentioned single mothers, everybody applauded. <laughs> um, so that gives you an idea of yeah. what sort of uh, people are com coming out to, to his rallies. Right. You know, interestingly enough, though, I drove about a 30 mile stretch of secondary highway. Uh -huh. I didn't see a single Democratic sign at one point. Really? I saw tons of Trump. I saw the occasional Jeb. Mm -hmm. I saw some Kasich. I did not see a Hillary or Bernie sign for about 30 miles. And so I don't know if that means that their people aren't supporting them or if there was an effort to take down the signs. Or maybe um, they were smart enough not to stop their car on a highway. Yes, this, no. I suppose that <laughs> might be true. Uh, so, you know, we've seen the latest polling in New Hampshire. Bernie's up anywhere from 20 to 30 points. Mm -hmm. uh, what's realistic in your view after after seeing what's happening on the ground there? Well, uh, you know, I Hillary's done well in New Hampshire in, in the past, but I don't think that history is really going to help her in this particular instance because, yeah. you know, Bernie has just, you know, even though it's on the other side of the Connecticut River, um, he certainly has a lot of uh, well, well wishers there, even before he ran for president, I imagine. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to see a Bernie victory in, uh, in uh, New Hampshire on, on right. Tuesday. And uh, we should say that that will be a Fairly remarkable thing, given that Hillary Clinton ran there in 2008 and won the New Hampshire primary mm -hmm. over Barack Obama, mm -hmm. uh, then Senator Barack Obama. So uh, a Bernie win this year, eight years later, would be uh, a pretty mighty feat uh, taking down the Clinton machine. Yeah, and hopefully it might give him a little bit of momentum going into South Carolina, where he is not leading by right. anything. And not and likely to win. No. So we'll, we'll, we'll check that out in a few weeks. Right. Uh, we'll leave the show there this week. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And join us again next week on uh, Capital Beat, a joint production of Vermont Press Bureau and Orca Media. And you can find the shows at orcamedia.net or vermontpressbureau.com. Thanks again. We'll see you next week.